time we pray that your hand would be upon us and that you would uh, open up our minds to hear what you would like to say to us tonight it's your word Lord and uh, we know that as it goes forth it won't return empty uh, but it is going to accomplish the purpose that you want it to and help us to uh, because it is your word uh, may we treat it as such and may we approach it uh, in in awe and in submission and uh, may we seek Lord uh, to understand what you would like to say to us tonight so bless the time we pray and uh, anybody else that's on the way get them here safe in Jesus name Amen okay so it's quiz time again <laughs> You remember what we've talked about with these letters the last four weeks, the different levels of application for each of the letters. So uh, who can give me uh, one of them? So like the compromising church? No, not the, we're not asking for a description of the oh, churches. Okay. We're, we're talking about the different levels of application uh, of the letters. The power persecuted that little list? Yes, uh-huh. <laughs> Do you want me to name them all? No, 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 no. No, you, you just wanted to do what she wanted to do. I <laughs> have to look It's my notes. I know, mine too. My notes. Well, good. They're good notes, but that's not what I'm asking. <laughs> One is just... I'll, we'll get to that in just a second, okay? Oh, uh, that is two. It was a letter written to specific churches. So right. That's okay, one that's and one of them. The personal application for the actual church. Yes. All right, and what's another one? Admonitional. Application? Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, they're all applications, but, but how are we applying them? One is an application to the actual church that the letter is being written to, but how about the application that we can give to our own lives? Yes, too. You know, we look at what is being said and we ask the Lord how does this apply to me what is there here for me to put into practice or to pray or you know so although Jesus is talking to that specific church he's talking to all of us yes he's talking to all of us and that that you remember where we get that idea from he who has an ear so we are the he or the she as it as it is right and then there is Another level of application. You remember what that is? I know there's two more. There's, there's one more, and then there's another. Uh, then there's the historical oh, thing. To yeah. The to a to a whole church. That's correct. That's correct. So he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So that's the the other level of application. So like our church here as a whole, this group of people gathered together we all need to pay attention to what this is saying to us as a as a body of believers and what are the messages here for us as a group to to uh, put into practice in our lives but how is that different than the personal application to the church that's to the actual church that the letter is being written to yeah. So, so, you know, the first one was Ephesus, right? So the letter was written to the church in Ephesus at that time, which was about 90 to 95 AD. So it had an application to that particular church in Asia Minor. And then it has an application to our church as well. And then it has an application to us as individuals. Yeah, so we need to see all of those things, those, if we're going to get out of the... The text what the Lord I think wants us to get out of the text and then there was the prophetic application and that's what you were no, referring I, to Gary local application admonitional personal prophetic apparently I don't have, have it quite right well the prophetic one is is the fourth one okay. so um, each of the churches represent uh, an aspect of the church in church history <coughs> right a period of church history so Ephesus was what that was apostolic. the apostolic church that's right of the first century then Smyrna referred to the 
Persecuted? The persecuted church. See, you know it's right. Persecuted. Well, some of them are right. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the second and third centuries, the persecuted church. That's when the, the, you know, the persecution of Christians was hot and heavy at that time. Churches, you know, people were meeting, but they were meeting in hiding. That's thrown to the lions? Yes, happened? yes, exactly. Okay. Um, and then Pergamos. Mm -hmm. That's right, the compromising church, third to the fifth centuries. And then Thyatira. The corrupt church. The corrupt church was from what period? Six what to period? 16th. Six to the sixteenth, that's right. Uh, what is that period of time also known as? The Dark Ages, the Middle Ages. Oh. Exactly. Oh, medieval. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And then now we come to Sardis. Sardis refers to the Church of the Reformation. Or the Protestant Church, if you will. As it came to be known after the Reformation from the 16th century up until the present time. Sardis was a city that was built at the top of a plateau. How many of you have seen pictures of um, Masada in Israel? Well, you've been there. Yeah. Uh, anybody else seen pictures of Masada? There was a movie made about Masada several years ago. Is it a place or a person? Or it's a place. It's a, it's a place, yes. It's in southern Israel down by the Dead Sea. Um, it, was, uh, it was a place where the Jews, uh, during the Roman invasion of 70 AD, took their last stand. Um, they were up on top of this plateau, and they thought that, you know, they were safe up there. There was only one way up and down. Uh, they had plenty of water, um, and uh, so they figured that the Romans would just leave them alone there. Uh, but they didn't. Instead, the Romans encamped around the place and just waited them out. And eventually, uh, as they were running out of water and food, and uh, and while they were while they were waiting, they were building this ramp, so the that Romans were. the Romans were building this ramp so that they could get up the side of Masada and then go over the wall and into the city. And so, of course, the Jews were watching that. Go ahead. Is that what Jeremiah was prophesying about the sea no. cramps? Or? No, no, that's different. Different. Yeah, that's, that's different. Same. same concept. This was a, this was like a siege ramp. Yes, they were building this, but instead of building it up against the city wall, which is what probably Jeremiah was referring to, they were building it. The it was like a mega siege ramp. Okay. You know, bigger than anything maybe that even had even been built up to that point and it was it was intended to allow the roman uh soldiers to scale this ramp all the way up to the top yeah. of uh where masada was and masada was, was kind of a it was flat on the top but it had it was surrounded you know it was like a mountain with the flat top on it so they built this siege ramp from the floor of the valley all the way up and, and it, was, you know, it was a massive, massive undertaking. Mm -hmm. And then finally, when the Jews saw that they, um, you know, they weren't going to be able to stop them, they met together that night in the synagogue and they came upon a plan where they were going to commit suicide rather than allow themselves to be taken captive by the Romans and made into slaves. Tremendous movie. Uh, it's you know it's an old one, but it's very very well done. If you get a chance to rent it or something, very educational. Um, is it just called Masada? Uh, is that what it's called? I think so. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, Sardis was like that. All that to say, Sardis was like that. It was it was this uh, plateau that was up about fifteen hundred feet above the valley floor. It was, it was, like I said, like Masada in that it had these sheer cliffs and again there was only one path, one narrow path leading up to uh, the top and that was really the only entrance into the city. And so because of that, just like the Jews made this mistake, uh, Sardis did as well. They thought that the city was impregnable. They thought that nobody would be able to conquer it. So, essentially, they dwelt in relative safety and security. Sardis was also a wealthy city. In the 6th 
century BC, the city was ruled by this fabulously wealthy king whose name was Croesus. And Croesus became sort of a, a byword for enormous wealth. Uh, for a long time, if somebody wanted to illustrate just how rich somebody was, they would say, he's as rich as Croesus. You ever heard of that before? It, it, it's not very common today. But. but today, you know, we might say, he's as rich as Bill Gates, or he's as rich as Warren Buffett. You know, so the two, two of the richest men in the world. So Herodotus tells us that Croesus was so rich that he had every guest that he, that he entertained, every guest was able to take as much gold as he could carry with them when they left. And so this one fellow asked Croesus if he could take his gold uh, at a later date. You know, uh, I, I, you know, I don't want to take it now, but can I come back, you know, say in two weeks and take it? And so Croesus said, sure, why not? And so the man returned a few weeks later with a coat that was covered with pockets inside and out. And, and not only this, but his body and the hair on his head were greased. And so he went into the treasury of Croesus, where he disrobed and he rolled in the gold dust, so that um, he was covered from head to toe with gold dust. And then he filled all the pockets of his coat with coins and nuggets, and he even filled his mouth with coins. His, no, literally, his, it was so heavy that he could barely move. He could, but he could barely move. And he came out, and Croesus saw this, and he, he just thought it was hilarious, you know. So he just laughed. Uh, but, but this guy Croesus, he just seemed to have the Midas touch in everything that he did. Um, very, very rich man. Now, when the Persian Empire was strong and conquering the other nations, Croesus decided, uh, I'm sorry, the king of, of Sardis decided that he would go to war against Persia. And he went to the Oracle of Delphi there in Greece, and he got the message from the Oracle that if he made a campaign against the Persians, that a great empire would fall. So he was encouraged by that message uh, from the Oracle, and he sent his troops out towards Persia. But he was soundly defeated. And they retreated all the way back to their fortress city. Of course, what he didn't stop to, to realize was that the empire that would fall would be his own. He, he thought it meant the other empire, you know. And, and uh, the oracle apparently didn't make that clear. And so Cyrus, the king of Persia at that time, pursued him and chased him all the way back to the city of Sardis. And he offered a large reward, uh, uh, Cyrus did, uh, to any soldier who could conquer the city. Now one of the soldiers noticed that uh, a soldier on the top of the city defending the walls uh, sort of slumbered off and fell asleep or a little bit and, and as his head nodded his helmet fell off and then down the wall uh, of the city, the outside of the wall, and down into this uh, crevice. And, and so when the soldier realized that he'd lost his helmet, you know, he kind of, it kind of woke him up and he realized, oh my gosh, I've lost my helmet, you know. He uh, climbed down the, this crevice into the area where the helmet had fallen and then he retrieved it and then he climbed back up again. Well, this Persian soldier saw this and when he saw it, he figured that if the enemy soldier could climb down the crevice and then back up again, then they ought to be able to climb up it as well. And so he, he led this contingent of soldiers up that crevice at night, and they scaled the wall. They found that everyone was asleep inside the city. There was no guard on the walls or in the city, and they were able to conquer the city while it slept. They had no guard out because they, they figured it was impossible for anybody to scale. The, the cliff and come into the city, you know. And then later on, the city was conquered 
in much the same way by the Greeks, by Alexander the Great. So the city of Sardis was sort of characterized by this complacent spirit. Um, they, 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 uh, they were just, you know, kind of ambivalent to things generally. Uh, they didn't get too worried about anything. And so that, that's going to have some significance as we get into the letter. Now, just one other thing I want to say before we actually read the letter. Normally, each of these letters, after the address and the description of Jesus, uh, has a, a few common characteristics. The next thing is usually what Jesus approves of in the church. And then after that, the accusation, and then following that, the admonition of the warning. Remember that? And then finally, at the end, the promise and the reward. Those, that's the basic pattern. Uh, the promise and the exhortation. But in, in the church of Sardis, I want you to notice something. Jesus doesn't say anything good about the church of Sardis. He goes right from the address and the description to the accusation. Even in the case of the compromising church of Pergamos and the corrupt church of Thyatira, he had something good to say to them. But in the case of Sardis, he has nothing good to say to them as a church. And I just want to say, God help that church uh, to which God or Jesus has nothing good to say. God help that church. We definitely don't want to be that church. That's why we need, I think, to take these messages very seriously. Okay? Let's get into the letter now. First, the address and the description of Jesus um, in chapter 3, verse 1. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. So that's actually, that's the, I read you a little bit too much there. These things, says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. So we'll just stop there. The way the Lord presents himself to each of these churches is really sort of a clue as to what the church needs. In the case of Ephesus, Jesus is the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. And they had forgotten that. They had forgotten that Jesus was in their midst. They, he, he hadn't left them, but, but they had left him when they had left their first love. Remember, that was the accusation against the uh, church in Ephesus. In the case of Smyrna, Jesus is called the first and the last, uh, the one who was dead and came to life again. And that church was the one that was under tremendous persecution, many of them being killed for their faith. And so Jesus promised them um, that he would have the last word in their persecution. He died, he was dead and came to life. The same would be true for them. In the case of Pergamos, Jesus is he who has the sharp two-edged sword. And remember, Pergamos was compromising their faith because they tolerated those who, who taught false doctrines. They needed to get back to the Word of God uh, and use it to judge the false teachers and to determine you know, which teachings that were being offered were false and which were good teachings. They, they needed to get back to the Word of God. So for them, Jesus is the one who has the sharp two-edged sword. Because remember in, in um, uh, da, 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 which book is it? I got a blank. But the one, uh, the one that's, you know, uh, um, the Word of God is living and active is Hebrews chapter 4, right? Verse 12. The Word of God is living and active sharper than any two-edged sword. And so they needed to get back to the word. And then in the case of Thyatira, Jesus is the son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and feet like fine brass. Thyatira was just plain corrupt and ripe for judgment. 
And so if they didn't repent, Jesus would expose their sins and bring judgment on them. And that's what the whole idea of the, the eyes like a flame of fire and feet like fine brass. It was you know, representation of impending judgment. Now here he calls himself him who holds the seven spirits and the seven stars. Now these symbols were identified for us in the first chapter of Revelation. The seven spirits are possibly a symbol of the Holy Spirit in his fullness. If you go back to Isaiah 11:2, it gives us a description of the sevenfold spirit of God there. And that could be what this is referring to. So it's the Holy Spirit in his fullness. And what this church at Sardis desperately needed was the Spirit. They needed to begin living by the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, because they were dead. They needed also to remember that Jesus is the Lord of his church. The church isn't to be run or governed by the standards of men but by the revealed Word of God. And I believe that we need to look to the book of Acts to find out what the church is supposed to look like. Really, if you start looking into church history beyond the book of Acts, then the, the, the corruption is already beginning. So we need to look to the book of Acts to find out what the church is all about. The, the Lord is in charge of the church. And these were truths that they had forgotten or they had forsaken in this church of Sardis. And then the seven stars, you remember, the seven stars are the messengers or the pastors of the seven churches. They too are in his hand. And since that's true, they need to be in submission to him. The pastors need to be in submission to the Lord Jesus Christ. And whenever the pastor goes off and does his own thing, and he abandons the Word of God, and he abandons the teachings of Scripture, and he just, uh, you know, teaches those things that, you know, he, they're his little, you know, pet projects or pet peeves or whatever it is that he's talking about, uh, then, then he's left the Lord, and he needs to get back. And, uh, and so because... This, is, this church is the way it is. Jesus has nothing good to say to this church. So he goes immediately into the accusation, which is the latter part of verse 1 there. He said, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive. But he says, really, you are dead. You, you have a name that, that you're alive, but really, you're dead. But he says, I know your works. And quite often, the life of the church is revealed in its deeds. But in Sardis, these were works that were done to impress people, apparently. They gave this church a name. They had a good reputation. But it was actually a dead church. The reputation was that it was really a, a live church. Like it was a good church. But really, Jesus said, it's, it's a dead church. The members of it were, for the most part, probably not even believers. They were, they were not spiritually alive. They were what we would call maybe nominal Christians. And you know, the word nominal comes from the word name. Someone who has a name for something. So Jesus said, you have a name that you are alive, but you are not alive. You're dead. Nominal. They were Christians in name only. This indicates, I think, a church made up of people who outwardly professed Christ. Probably most, if not all of them, thought of themselves as believers, but who actually possessed no spiritual life. They were dead. They were Christians in name only. Contemporary poet has described churches like this in these words, outwardly splendid as of old, inwardly lifeless, dead, and cold. Her force and fire all spent and gone. Like the dead moon, she still shines on. Yeah, I was just reading something about the moon recently. You know, the moon has these... Uh, huge mountains 
that are almost as high as, high as Mount Everest in these, these deep ocean beds that have no water. So, like the dead moon, you know, you, you can't have life without water. Life requires water. No water on the moon. So it's dead. It's essentially a dead planet. Like the dead moon, she still shines on. The moon is still shining. Looks like something's happening there, right? Unfortunately, and this is a very sad thing to have to say, but unfortunately there are probably thousands of churches like that around the world today. It, it's what gives non-Christians such a negative impression of the Christian faith. They see the profession, they hear the wonderful words, but there's no life in them. Nothing backs those words up. Hollywood has given us a name for people like that. It calls them zombies. Corpses that are alive that walk about as though they are living, but really they're still, they're just dead. They're dead. Ray Stedman, Pastor Ray Stedman from the uh, uh, ch uh, church up in Palo Alto, California. Uh, he's, he's passed on now with the Lord, but what a great Bible teacher. Said that as we read this letter, we are looking at the first zombie church of Sardis. <laughs> that word has been updated a little bit recently in a book called The Singer by Calvin Miller. He, listen to what he says. Many Christians are really Christaholics and not disciples at all. Disciples are cross-bearers. They seek Christ. Christaholics seek happiness. Disciples dare to discipline themselves, and the demands they place on themselves leave them enjoying the happiness of their growth. Christaholics are escapists, looking for a shortcut to nirvana. Like drug addicts, they are trying to bomb out of their depressing world. Pretty interesting, huh? This is a case of looks like a duck, walks like a duck, talks like a duck, smells like a duck, but it's not a duck. It's something else, and it's not alive. The church at Sardis, says our Lord, is a church that has a reputation for being alive, but is really dead. It's a church of Christaholics. But there was a time, apparently, when this church was alive, uh, when it was filled with people who knew the Lord. Because they knew Him, they were involved in ministering to the needs of the people in the city. And that's, that's the way they won this good reputation. And now they appeared to be a people committed to good works. They were apparently still doing the good works. But again, there was no life in them. There was no life there anymore. Remember that Paul warns us that, of that condition in uh, 1 Corinthians 13. Remember that? He says, Though I speak in tongues, and have the gift of prophecy, and can fathom all mysteries and knowledge, and have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, he says, I am a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Here was a church that once had a great ministry, but it had slipped away from them. It, it once had much impact, apparently, in the city of Sardis, but now nothing is happening of any spiritual value. Dr. William Barclay uh, has said, a church is in danger of death when it begins to worship its own past, when it is more concerned with forms than with life when it loves systems more than it loves Jesus, when it is more concerned with material than it is with spiritual things. In other words, this is the way we've always done it. Uh, you know, it's never been done any other way, and it's always worked in the past, and so that's why we're gonna keep doing it today. Essentially, they're worshiping their past. They're saying, you know, there's no possibility of a better way or, you know, 
this is the way it's always been done. And so we're just going to keep doing that. Again, Ray, Ray Stedman said, this church in Sardis was so devoid of life that it actually had no struggles going on within it. Notice the difference, he says, between it and the other churches. There are no Jewish accusers of this church, even though there was a large colony of Jews in the city of Sardis. They ignored the church, or perhaps didn't even know of its existence. There were no false apostles here. There were no domineering Nicolaitans who needed to be guarded against. There was no female seducers as at Thyatira. In other words, there was nothing. Zip! That was the ministry of the church at Sardis. Now Sardis, as I said earlier, represents the church of the Reformation, which came to be uh, known as the Protestant church from the 16th century to the present. Tim LaHaye, uh, the, the author of the uh, many, many books, but the Left Behind books are uh, probably his most popular books, says that Sardis means escaping ones or those who come out. That name, along with what Jesus says here, I think provides a pretty good description of the Reformation churches. They were the escaping ones. They were a group of people that had come out of the Roman Catholic Church because of what they believed were many unscriptural practices that were doing damage to the lives of many, many people. And though the Reformation had many, many positive things going for it, it also had some negative things. Most people don't talk about that if, you know, if they're from a Protestant church, uh, but they had some negative things going on there too. The Catholics seemed bent on emphasizing quite a few pagan doctrines uh, as opposed to scriptural teaching. And Martin Luther uh, wanted to get back to the Bible with his watchword, the just shall live by faith. He'd read the book of Romans and it transformed his life. And, and so he wanted to get back to the Bible. He had rebelled against the idea that salvation was the result of works. He, he, he believed that it was the result of, of uh, grace through faith. And he got this from Romans and, and also from a reading Galatians. Uh, and, and he sparked this renewed interest in studying the Bible uh, as individuals. He wanted the Bible to be available to the common person. And, you know, right about that time, uh, just before that, was when the printing press was invented and they were starting to print Bibles so that more people would have access to them. And people were very, very interest, interested in those things. But the weakness of the Reformation is that it didn't reform enough. They retained many of the customs and teachings of the church that, that, that they came out of. Infant baptism is one of those things. It continued in spite of the fact that there is no scriptural basis for infant baptism. Uh, they continued to sprinkle in their baptismal services instead of immerse. Now, I don't think that these are big deals. They're not essentials of the faith, but it's just, you know, examples of things that they really should have reformed at the same time. But they didn't. And ritualism and formality and tradition not based on the Word of God also continued in many ways in the Reformation churches instead of just the simplicity of worshiping God from our hearts and having a good old-fashioned Bible study. There are many people today within the Protestant church who by virtue of the fact that they were baptized when they were babies feel that they are Christians. No, they were under attack. And so this is, I think, clearly a reference to the second coming of Christ. Because he says this several times, doesn't he? he? He's telling them to wake up from their spiritual sleep and watch out for his return. They were to expect his soon return to the earth. They were to keep focused on Christ's return because of the impetus it gives us for holy living. 
Titus 2, 11 to 13, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we need to keep watching for His return, for the return of our Savior, if we want to avoid becoming a dead church. And this is what we've been learning on Sunday mornings, too, as we've been going through Matthew 24 and 25, right? Those are the, those are the three things. He, Jesus said, be, be watchful, uh, be ready, and be faithful as, you, as we wait for these things to come to pass. Second, he tells them to strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. He says there, uh, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Apparently, there was still hope for them. I love that. Not everything was dead. There, there were still some good things that were hanging on. Certainly, if, if there are two things that have been de-emphasized in many churches, it's the teaching of the Word of God and the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. In many mainline denominations today, the inerrancy of the Bible has been abandoned. Uh, it's no longer considered to be the Word of God. And that's unfortunately what has happened in many of these churches that I have mentioned. The Bible is no longer the Word of God. And so, you know, when the Bible is no longer the Word of God, then, you know, you can just take it or leave it if you want to. It becomes nothing more than just, uh, you know, another self-help book or another, uh, you know, book on positive thinking or, you know, a psychological, you know, feel good kind of a thing. But you can't really read the Bible, certain portions of the Bible and walk away feeling good because it talks about judgment. It talks about sin. It talks about, but these are the things that they would say, well, this is not the word of God. And so that's how they get away from their consciences and having to deal with these things that the Word of God says, you know, we shouldn't be doing these things and we definitely should be doing these things. Well, if it's, if it's not the Word of God, then you could just take it or leave it. It's, it has no authority, right? So this is, what, this is what a lot of these churches are doing. And so the Bible has, again, just been reduced to another self-help manual that has some good things, but also some things that you can feel free to ignore. And of course, now that we have things like higher criticism and seminaries and Bible scholars, we, we don't need the Holy Spirit to help us or to teach us anymore either. You know, because we have learned individuals that it, all we have to do is listen to these guys and they've studied, you know, and they're, they're we, they call them higher critics. These are the guys that come and they analyze the Bible and they tell us which parts of the Bible uh, are actually the Word of God and which parts are not. They tell us, uh, you know, you have your red letter Bible there. I've got a red letter Bible. You know, you know what the red letters mean, right? It means those are the words that Jesus spoke. Well, these guys have the audacity because they are, you know, higher critics. They have the audacity to tell us that Jesus didn't actually say all of those things that are in red letters. And, we've ta and how do we know this? We've taken a vote. They're a committee of guys. It's called, I'm not making this up. <laughs> it's, it's a committee of, of learned men and women, too, called the Jesus Seminar. Google it when you go home. And you'll, you'll find it. It's there. The Jesus Seminar. These guys, based upon their learnedness, and based upon, you know, what they say is, you know, their analyzation of the Greek or the Hebrew or whatever, and, and um, also their presuppositions about what they think is possible and what they think is not possible. And they don't believe in miracles. So anything that is a miracle in the Bible, they automatically say, that's not the Word of God because miracles can't happen. And, you know, if Jesus says anything about doing a miracle, 
then they automatically say, oh, well, that can't be the words of Jesus because miracles can't happen. You know, and so it, 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 it's really not, it, the bottom line is it's not based upon their learnedness at all. It's just simply based upon their presuppositions against anything supernatural. Isn't that kind of sat satanic influence? You think? <laughs> That's what would come into my mind. Yes, absolutely. I mean, isn't that what Satan would want us to believe? That the Bible is not really the Word of God and you don't have to pay attention to it? If there's no miracles, Jesus didn't rise from the dead. That's right. That's it. So then Christianity, you might as well just throw it into the trash can. Because it's no different than anything else. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then the whole Christian message is meaningless. But he did rise from the dead. He conquered death. And because he conquered death, when we trust in him, we'll be able to conquer death too. If you don't have that, then the only thing you have to look forward to at the end of your life is you're going to rot in the grave and the, the maggots are going to eat you up. That's it. So, listen to, listen to how Galatians 3.3 3 responds to this. We don't need the Holy Spirit to teach us. We have all these very, very smart men and women. Listen to how Galatians 3.3 responds to this. He says, Paul says, Are you so foolish that having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? You started off well. You, were, you had submitted yourself to Jesus. He filled you with His Holy Spirit. You began to respond to life based upon the Spirit working in your life and the power of the Holy Spirit, giving you the courage to face the persecution that you faced. And, you know, it's all these, these things that God's Holy Spirit gives us the ability to do that we are just simply too weak in our flesh to do for whatever reason. But now you're willing to abandon that and go back to the flesh? Your flesh is now able to solve your problems? Are you now being made perfect by the flesh? They needed to get back to the Word of God and the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Their works were not perfect before God, so they needed to get back to the Bible and the Spirit so that they could find out what they needed to change and then so that they would have the power to do it. The Holy Spirit provides the power. Without the Bible, we'll never know the, word, the will of God. And without the Spirit, we'll never know the help and the power of God in our lives. So strengthen, he says, the things which remain. The church today needs to do the same thing. Third, he tells them to remember how they have received and heard. Look at verse 3. He says, Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Remember how you've received and heard. Return, in other words, to the truths of God's Word. Hold fast to them. Trust in them as you once did. When you first gave your life to Jesus Christ, you trusted in God. You trusted in the Word of God. You believed that the Word of God was, was true. And you, you put your faith in the Word of God. Every time, you know, when you were first saved, uh, uh, the, every time the church doors were open, you were there. You were hanging on every word that the teacher spoke. You would take your Bible to work with you. You'd read it while you were on your lunch break, your coffee break. Now, maybe you didn't do all of these things. But a, a person who is saved and is really excited will do these things. And he's saying, get back to that. You know, read the Word of God. Let the Word of God speak to you as the verses just fly off the pages into your face. Remember, he says, how you have received and heard. Remember how you've received and heard. Remember how it was when you were a new believer, in other words. Remember how the Spirit spoke to you. Remember how you'd read the Word and it was just so exciting. You couldn't wait to get to Bible study, you know. Remember how you've received and heard. Fourth, he says, 
he tells them to hold fast there in, in uh, that sec just after that part. Hold fast, he says. Hold fast. I like what Colossians 2 6 says. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. This is what I think it means when it says to hold fast. It means to continue to walk with Jesus. Continue to keep him number one in your life. Let nothing else get ahead of him. That, I believe, is the cure to dead orthodoxy. A firm and fast and daily commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. And for many who have claimed to be Christians when they are really dead spiritually, that requires the fifth thing that he tells them. He says there, the, uh, in the middle part of verse 3, he says, uh, Hold fast and repent. Hold fast and repent. So how do you lay hold of the Spirit? How do you bring the Spirit's life back into a church which has the gospel? Scripture only suggests one way, and it's really very simple. In its briefest form, <laughs> it is repent and believe. <laughs> repent. That's what Jesus said. That was the, the first message that Jesus preached. Of course, John the Baptist preached it before Jesus. But when Jesus went out and preaching in the wilderness, he preached the same thing. Repent and believe the gospel. Look at yourself. See your wrong attitudes, your wrong outlook, your self-appraisal as unacceptable before God. And then believe. Cast yourself upon the grace of Jesus. Receive from Him the word of grace. Let it take deep root in your heart. And He will impart to you the life of the Spirit of God. That is what the members of this church needed to repent and to believe. And that's what many in the church need to do today. Finally, let's look at the, the promise and the exhortation in verses 4 to 6. He said, You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Even though the church was dead, there were still people in the church who were not. And to those who, who were not dead, Jesus talks about them as walking with him in white, verse 4, and being given white garments, verse 5. White garments are always in Scripture a symbol of redemption. In Revelation 7.14, we read of a great multitude of people who come out of the great tribulation and who have been washed, uh, uh, who have washed their robes and made them white, in the blood of the Lamb, Revelation 7.14. Clearly, white garments are a sign of being redeemed, being saved by the grace of God. Remember Isaiah's great word in Isaiah 1.18, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. That is what the blood of the Lamb can do. These are said to be worthy, not because they've lived good moral lives, not because they, they have, uh, you know, had, you know, good works accompanying them wherever they go. Uh, many of them likely had not, but because they had washed away their sins in the blood of the Lamb. They were worthy because God had imparted to them the righteousness of Christ. That is the gift that he gives to all who come by faith to him. You need no longer try to earn your way or work your way or, uh, you know, uh, impress your way into a good relationship with God. You can never do it. So uh, why even try, you know? Uh, you, you get into a good relationship with God by believing in his word 
than by receiving his forgiveness. And then he says to the overcomer that he will not blot his name out of the book of life, but he'll confess his name before the Father and before his angels. So this is kind of an interesting statement, isn't it? Apparently, there is something called the book of life. And this book of life definitely has something to do with salvation. Those names, those names, those whose names are written in it apparently are saved, and those who are not in it are not saved. According to Revelation 17, 8, there are some living during the tribulations, uh, during the tribulation whose names were never in the book of life. I can't, I can't explain it away. It's there. It says that. There are some living during the tribulation whose names were never in the book of life. Revelation 17, 8, it says, And those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. See? That little qualification there, not just that they're not written in the book of life, but they're not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they see the beast that was and is not yet is. And yet it's clear from passages like Philippians 4.3 and uh, Revelation 21.27 that those who have given their lives to Jesus are written in the book of life. Philippians 4.3, And I urge you, also true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, and with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Revelation 21, 27, But there shall be no means, there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles, speaking about the new Jerusalem um, after the thousand year reign of Christ, or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So this book of life appears to be a big deal, doesn't it? It sounds like I want to be sure my name is in it, right? But it is a little troubling that there are some whose names were never in it. I'm, I'm a little troubled by that. I don't know why that is. But I, 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 I try not to worry about it. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you how I, I deal with it. How does a person make sure their name is in the book of life? How do you make sure? I'm open for suggestions. How do you make sure your name is in the book of life? Ask forgiveness. Ask for God's grace through Jesus. Yes, that's right. That's right. First, receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Second, be an overcomer. Honestly, I think that means to keep walking with him and loving Jesus until you die or until he comes. This passage clearly says that the overcomer will not be blotted out, right? So I definitely want to be an overcomer. That's one of the things that I'm really focused on in life. The other one is what you said. Receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You say, well, what if my name's not in the book of life? Well, you don't know that. I don't know that. But here's what I know. Here's how I, here's how I know you can make sure your name is in the book of life. Receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior and be an overcomer. So if you do that, then you don't have to worry about whether or not your name is in the book of life. Because Jesus says it's there. Of course, that's not something you really can do without the power of the Holy Spirit. So we're not talking really about a works-based salvation here either. I, I can't be saved without the power of the Spirit working in my life, without the Holy Spirit drawing me to Jesus. The beauty is, He draws everybody, I think. And there are some that you know, just won't be drawn. They refuse the influence of the Holy Spirit 
in their life. And, and so uh, I really need the power of the Holy Spirit. So it's, you see why we emphasize two, the two things? The Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. I can't be an overcomer without the power of the Spirit working in my life. So Jesus started off this letter by saying, These things said he who has the seven spirits of God. Right? This church needed the Spirit of God because it was a dead church. And folks, we need the Spirit of God if we're going to be spiritually alive and if we're going to be the overcomers that he wants us to be. And since Jesus is the one with the seven spirits of God, it only makes sense that we need to come to him for the power that we need to overcome. So, he who has a, an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. So he, that's you and me, right? He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That's us as a group. So may we hear tonight. If we strayed away from the Word of God, let's get back to the Word of God. If we've been trying to live the Christian life in the power of the flesh, then let's get back to the Spirit. Ask the Spirit to, to fill us, to empower us, to be overcomers. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word tonight. A powerful word it is. Lord, we definitely don't ever, 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 ever want to come close even to being like this church in Sardis. I do thank you for the, the ones that were there that uh, hadn't defiled their garments. And I pray that we would be among those folks. If we have to go visit the church of Sardis, may we be those that haven't defiled their garments. And if we have, then I pray that you will help us, Lord, to confess that to you and to ask you to forgive us and to fill us with your Spirit and help us to live as we should. So, we pray that you'll do that in our lives. Baptize us afresh and new right now in your Spirit, Father. Fill us with your Spirit. Fill us with your power so that we can please you in everything that we say and do. We thank you for the freedom that is there. We thank you for the privilege that you've given to us to walk with you. We praise you now for it in Jesus' name. Amen.